Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we have this computer to look at. It's an Acorn Electron. This computer was donated to the channel by Jude back in May of 2021, sent all the way in from the UK. And uh, as far as I'm aware, these were never sold in North America. And other than this one I'm holding in my hands, I've never seen one of these in person either. Jude told me this computer wasn't working, so this is most likely gonna be a repair, but at the minimum, I don't have the power supply this thing needs, so we're gonna have to swap the power supply out before we can even power this up. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, we have a package here from Jude in the UK. Hello to all my UK viewers. Let's see what we have here. It looks like a computer and some additional goodies here. All right, let's check out the note from Jude. Hi, Adrian, I hope this letter finds you well and the package made it to you one piece. I've been a massive fan of your content since the Macintosh Repair-a-thon, still waiting for that portable repair. Yeah, I don't know if the camera's picking it up, but the Mac portable sitting over there on the floor. I still haven't gotten to it. I will eventually. There's just so much stuff. As I look around the basement here, there's so much stuff to work on. Your videos are inspiring and help a lot of people, and I hope you know that you mean a lot to us all. I certainly know it has improved my repair and troubleshooting process. As we discussed over Patreon messages, I have recently been getting into the Acorn computers, and upon double-checking your video catalog, I noticed you have two BBC micros, but no, and he puts the name of the computer, which he's included here, so I'm not gonna say that. We'll open that up in a second. So I have included the computer, a user's guide, and another book. In addition, he has gone to the supermarket and he went and bought me a bunch of stuff that I actually requested specifically from the UK. Okay, so he goes on to talk about the computer a little bit more. Uh, let's open this up and then I'll read the rest of his letter. So some people may be able to tell, or maybe not, what this is. The fact that he said it was an Acorn computer might give away a little bit about what it is. Okay, how freaking cool is this? Very nice condition, I have to say. Oh, the keyboard feels really nice. He also sent me the user guide, the original user guide and also start programming with the electric. Let's check out the letter again here. He says, so this electron doesn't work. I've checked the voltage coming from the power board and they're all present and accounted for. So I believe the fault is on the logic board. On the right hand side of the logic board, I noticed something has been cut in half for some reason, a resistor. I suspect this will be the culprit. I can confirm, however, the keyboard works perfectly. I tested it with my working electron. Oh, thank you, Jude really feels nice. That's a nice feeling keyboard. When this machine works, you should hear a beep from the speaker and the orange light turns on to the left of the caps lock. There's a little LED right there. Finally, I need to mention that the computer came with no screws for the outer case and a few of the inner ones are missing. So I bought a fresh set specifically meant for this machine and popped them in for you as well. You must have cleaned this machine, Jude, because it, it looks mint. The two books included are a must for any Electron user as they originally came in the box. So I bought those separately to make sure you had the set. Again, so thoughtful, Drew, thank you. There's also an edge protector on the pins on the back, which he 3D printed. I think you can see that's just a little white thing right there. Originally it shipped with sort of smoky white colored one, uh, but they fit quite loosely so they were always lost. So he, he made me a new one. There it is. Yeah, nice. That just sort of covers the expansion port that's on there. The Acorn Electric is quite an interesting machine that is almost completely compatible to the BBC Micro. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, and I hope you have fun messing around with it. I can't wait to see it crop up on midweek mini mail call and hopefully see it working again. Stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you again for all that you do, Jude. Very nice letter, Jude, thank you very much. This is the BBC Master that I've previously shown on the channel and uh, done a bunch of work to. The Master is the evolved version of the original BBC Model B. Both of these machines were made by Acorn and were sold and marketed in partnership with the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, and were very, very popular as an education computer in the UK and in Australia and probably some other countries as well. 
It's my understanding, and the caveat applies that I'm far from an expert on the subject, the BBC Model B and the BBC Master were extremely popular and pretty much found in every school across the UK, but they weren't as popular inside people's homes. And I think that was due to their relative high cost. Now, I did a little bit of reading recently, and it seems like the cost of the regular Model B computer was roughly the same as the Commodore 64, which here in North America was considered a relatively inexpensive computer compared to its competitors like the Apple II and the IBM PC. But in the UK, there were other cheaper options like the ZX Spectrum available, which saw a much bigger uptake in the home. Because of the fact that these machines, well, specifically the Model B, which is the smaller version of this, weren't selling that well at home, Acorn developed and marketed this computer here, the Acorn Electron. So it doesn't have any of the BBC branding and the color scheme of the original Model B or the Master here, but this has a much lower cost and is obviously physically much smaller, as you can see, and was designed specifically for the home user in mind, but yet retained some amount of compatibility with the other BBC models, including the same BBC Basic. Just like its siblings though, it was a 6502 base computer, but it had a very simplified motherboard and lacked a lot of the expansion capabilities of these machines, which I think helped reduce the cost. The form factor of this computer is absolutely adorable. I just love the size of it. Look at it compared to my hands here. The keyboard feels really nice to type on actually. And I think these are very similar or the same mechanical switches that are on the BBC Master. I love this liney 80s looking sticker that's on the top. And the computer, as you can see, is very thin and really cute. On the bottom here, it says Acorn 1982. This will be a machine from the UK, so this is a PAL computer. Over here on the side is an AC input. You can just see there, 19 volts AC power in. Unfortunately, I don't have a 19 volt AC power supply handy, and I don't really know if I can just give this thing 19 volts DC, like from a laptop power supply, and have it work. And on the left side of the machine, we do have some ports here, and I'm just showing the labels here. So we have an RF output composite video, which I think is monochrome, an RGB output, which should have the same pinout as the BBC machine, so I already have a cable for that, and a cassette interface port. So you can get a sense of size. Let's compare it to the size of the Commodore 64 here. Well, it's a VIC-20 case, but of course it's exactly the same size. And yes, the machine is overall a little smaller, but it is actually quite a bit thinner. And it's also lighter, I'd say as well. Although maybe it's not that much lighter. The plastic quality seems to be decent. It's a little squeaky, the case, and it's not as good as on the BBC Model B or the Master but the Commodore 64 case is uh, notoriously cheap and flimsy. Now, unfortunately, I don't really know a whole lot about the specs of this machine, and I did a quick perusal in the manual here, and it didn't really talk about it, at least in the first few chapters. So let's go to Wikipedia and see if we can read a little bit more about the Electron and what makes it different than the Model B and the BBC Master. So right off the bat, according to Wikipedia, yes, this machine was a low cost alternative to the BBC Micro, which, as I said, was a similar price to the Commodore 64, and was not cost competitive with the ZX Spectrum, which was selling like hotcakes at the time. The Electron only sports 32K of RAM and includes BBC Basic 2 and a ROM operating system on there. So it is very capable as a basic machine. So even though the bottom said 1982, it does look like this thing was actually released in 1983 and it was 199 pounds, which from my understanding was about half the price of the Commodore 64 when it launched a year earlier. At least in North America, the price of the Commodore 64 dropped like a rock after it was released. So I wouldn't have been surprised that if in the UK, when this came out for $199, that it wasn't long after that, that the Commodore 64 dropped in price dramatically to be much more cost competitive with this. It does say here on Wikipedia that several expansions were made available to provide many of the capabilities emitted from the BBC Micro. It seems Acorn offered something called the Plus One, which gave you analog joystick and parallel ports together with a cartridge slot, which ROM carts providing software or other kinds of hardware expansion, such as disk interfaces, could be inserted. The problem is with that type of expansion interface is that history has taught us that when you offer an inexpensive computer and you make stuff optional, what happens is people program for the lowest common denominator. So I can't imagine very much cartridge-based software was released for this computer because you needed that extra interface unit to even use a cartridge. If the cartridge slot had just been integrated into the machine itself, like on a Commodore 64, then there could be lots of cartridge games because you know that everyone with a Commodore 64 is gonna be able to play that game. 
Either way, the article goes on to talk about the fact that this is a miniaturized BBC Micro. And one of the big recipes for this machine's miniaturization and cost savings was the use of a ULA. It's very similar to the ZX Spectrum. Using that uncommitted logic array reduces the number of chips from 102 on the BBC Micro down to 12 to 14. The Electron reviewed relatively favorably for its low cost and also 640 wide graphics. So that should mean 80 column text. On the other hand, there did seem to be a lot of complaints about things like the lack of a teletext screen mode and the fact that this machine ran around half the speed of the original BBC. And this sentence here is very telling. This reduced performance is attributed to the fact that the system uses four bit wide memory. I must admit that in the world of eight bit computers in the eighties, at least, that was kind of unheard of. Four bit wide memory implies that this machine uses 64K DRAMs, but only four of them. So that's kind of extreme penny pinching. While the ULA is consuming all of the RAM bandwidth during the active portion of the display line, the CPU is unable to access the RAM. This Electron uses the Signer Tech variant of the 6502 as that allowed the clock to be stopped for 40 microsecond period. Yeah, the original 6502, you couldn't stop the clock. That would actually cause the processor to crash, essentially. Only later versions of 6502 had the ability to like stretch the clock signal to slow it down or stop it briefly, which is obviously what's happening here on the Electron. And here are the specs. So it runs at two megahertz or one megahertz effective while it's accessing the RAM. It has that Ferranti semiconductor ULA, 32K of RAM, 32K of ROM. And as I mentioned, has up to 640 by 256 resolution, which is 80 by 32 characters in two colors. It does have a TTL RGB output, so eight colors, and there's no intensity bit, which is why you don't have 16 colors. And as I thought earlier, the composite video output provides a grayscale image of the standard machine, but an internal modification allows a color image to be produced, albeit with a degradation in picture quality. All right, well, I think that's enough background about this machine. Let's open this thing up and take a look at what it looks like inside and then see if I can address this power supply and we can get this thing working. Well, let's flip this thing over and pull out the screws, which there are just four of them. Okay, look at that. It's got one of those horrible ribbon cables. Now it actually looks like there's some type of a regular pin connection there. So it's not like I have to take the ribbon out. Ah, yes, that's kind of cool. Interesting is the keyboard here, which has this aluminum or aluminum, because of course this comes from the UK, structure has a bend in the corner here, like it's been dropped at some point. I can see that it actually uses a metal base plate and a PCB, so that probably has a lot to do with why it feels so nice to type on. And it's pretty fancy, to be honest, for an inexpensive computer. Looking at the computer, this is obviously a later revision because uh, that is some interesting looking ULA chip there. And underneath this wire there, it says issue six. So that's probably one of the later versions. I think that article said that it was one through four, which had some type of a chip here, probably a PLCC that would come out of its socket. It goes without saying though, the negative about this is this looks like it's actually soldered onto the board. So if there's a problem with this ULA chip, well, there's not a whole lot I can do. I guess I could try to install a PLCC socket there and source another uh, ULA chip, but not like you can get those very easily. This bodge wire here is, um, a little haphazard uh, on its installation. And this computer is very impressive with its low chip count. 32K ROM, we have a 6502 CPU there. We have the four RAM chips that it was talking about, the ULA, and then we just have some TTL chips and that's it. Clearly the ULA does a lot of the heavy lifting on this machine with all the access to the RAM and probably drives the cassette port and the video output and the RGB and everything. The RAM is from Hitachi and 1984 11th week. 1984 36th week. This one over here is 1984 41st week. And in fact, this one over here is 1984 45th week. So this is a very late model machine getting close to uh, the end of the production run, it seems like. And here's the power supply. And I can see that this runs on five volts and minus five volts looking at the connector right there. Looking at what's going on here, that's the AC input here, the barrel jack. And it looks like it goes through these gray wires here right up to the expansion header here. So this probably is for powering up external devices and this just passes through whatever AC comes in here right to that. So it needs to have its own power supply rectifier and whatnot to create the DC voltages. And then we just have a very simple AC to DC converter right here to generate these two voltage rails. Now I had an original idea, which I mentioned earlier about just putting like 19 volts DC into this power supply and hopefully that would work. 
but the fact that it has a minus voltage rail here means that it's using the lower part of the AC waveform to generate that negative voltage. So I cannot do that, and I'm going to need to replace this with something else so I can generate the voltage rails that the motherboard needs. Obviously, this expansion connector is not going to get the AC voltage that it wants, but that's not a problem right now because I don't even have any expansion interface. And I'm assuming if there's ever one that I do get for this, it's going to be something like an SD card reader, and there's no way that's going to use any kind of an AC voltage. That will just use the DC that's probably also provided on this connector. So let's get this thing out of here, and I'm going to see what I can figure out for replacing this with something a little bit more modern. All right, and this is what I have come up with. This is an ATX4 VC power supply. This was sent in on a previous mail call episode. I forgot the name of the viewer who did this, but it's an open source project. And this is basically an adapter for a Pico ATX power supply, which is what you have right here. So this just takes 12 volts input and then generates a normal ATX power supply output. Well, this board here has a regulator here to take the minus 12 volts that this generates, bring it down to five volts, and then it gives you a couple different ways to hook up your retro computer. You can use these things here just to insert the wires into there and it actually generates all the various voltages you might need. 3.3, five volts, minus five, 12 volts, minus 12, and there's also a five volt standby. And what I did here is it came with this harness and I repinned this to use the same color cables as this. So the minus five volt is the blue wire, black is ground, and five volts is the red wire. Now it looks like this machine has no provision for a power switch right now, but if I feel like drilling a hole in it, I can install this toggle switch right here, which then plugs into this board right there on that header, or I can just use a jumper so that it's on all the time as soon as you connect up the 12 volts. There is the issue, of course, that the barrel jack has no way to mount, so what I can do is desolder this from this board and just hot glue that in there, attaching these wires to it. Or I suppose I could put the power supply in here, remove some of the components from it, and then I could probably just fit this right into here and attach the power wires right to the original connector. I have a feeling if I completely mutilate this original power supply, people are probably gonna freak out. So for now, I'll just stick this in here with some hot glue and uh, just hot glue in a DC barrel jack. Alrighty, there we go. The ATX power supply is in, and of course it's installed with hot glue. And um, the hot glue I'm using is this Gorilla stuff. It's really quite good. It holds this in fine, and there's some dabs of it under here, and you can see I can pick the whole computer up and there's no issues. I did go ahead and I removed the cable off this power supply, the original one, and I soldered that onto the wires on this. Before I plug it into the motherboard, of course, I'm gonna power this up just to make sure everything is working. The nice thing about this setup, of course, is I could just use regular old 12 volt wall warts. I mean, who doesn't have a ton of these lying around from like old external hard drives and stuff. So let's plug this in. I currently don't have the jumper on there, so it won't even turn on. We should just get the standby light and you can just see it down there. That's the five volt standby. Here's a jumper for power on and we just put it on these two pins and there we go. The whole thing powers up now and we should be getting those voltage rails on this connector. Black wire, red wire, Get a nice 5.07 volts. And with the blue wire, minus 5.935. Perfect. All right, I just noticed that this might be in the wrong spot. I might need to move this around a little bit. And that's just because I can see the keyboard probably rests on this and it might actually interfere with this part of the ATX power supply. I'll try to figure that out after we see if this computer is even working. Okay, so for testing this thing, I'm just gonna use the composite video output here, which is monochrome, but that's plenty fine for our testing purposes. Let's just make sure that we are on the composite input and we are indeed. And I guess we're ready for testing. So let's uh, plug this in. I guess here we go. We have no video. Let me feel around here, see if anything is hot. No, nothing is hot at all. All right, let's do some rudimentary testing here. So I plug the power in, you see what's going on there. Let's check for five volts. Yep, 5.04 volts. I mean, I think it would be very unlikely we wouldn't be getting five volts when we have a whole ATX power supply supplying five volts to the system. Let's make sure we're getting the minus five volts and we are, I don't know where that goes on the board, but it's getting to, it's getting to this. The minus five volt rail is generated by this little voltage regulator right here. So it's possible if there was a short or something there, this could have been pulled down to some kind of low voltage. I don't know what uses the minus five volts. I'm assuming it might be the ULA, maybe for the sound generation, or it could just be going directly to the expansion connector. I think most of the stuff on here is just normal five volts. 
All right, well, let's pull out the video cable because that flashing is not doing anyone any good. And it's time to break out the schematics and the oscilloscope. All right, there was a fourcorn.co.uk website that seems to have the schematics for all sorts of different acorn machines, including a really good quality scan on this machine. Uh, zooming in a little bit, here are the four RAM chips that we know all about now. There are only four of them instead of the normal eight. And this goes into the ULA here. This is the IC1 ULA, and this just has connections to basically everything. So it does all the RAM refreshing, all that four bit to eight bit RAM conversion. There's connections to all the address bus, the processor bus there, data bus that is, the clock stuff goes through that. I think it generates the clock signal itself. There's clock in, clock out comes out of the ULA and goes to the CPU. Anyhow, as per normal for troubleshooting, the very first thing we need to do is we need to take a look at the reset signal on the CPU. So that's pin 40. It looks like it's generated by the ULA. Yes, it goes to the cartridge connector. It goes to the CPU. It makes its way over here to the break key on the keyboard. So I guess that's like a hardware reset. And yep, that's it. So it seems like the ULA itself is handling the reset. Now let's just look down here really quick at what's going on. So there's some kind of a clock generation thing here. So there's two different crystals, NTSC and PAL. So obviously there were provisions for this to run in NTSC land. On the ULA, we also have composite sync. RGB is output there. HS, and then there's this whole complicated thing here, which I think is generating the chroma signal based on that RGB. So it's basically converting the RGB into a color composite that goes to the RF modulator there through the video circuitry. And then I think LK4 here, that's a jumper link you could install. This is the composite video output, which is in monochrome, which is what we connected up to. So that is just simply taking the RGB output and it's going through some passives and there is a transistor. So that transistor could be bad. We might have a good video signal and maybe that's the problem there. Uh, it looks like though this adds the chroma signal from that lower section, which is normally going to the RF modulator. So the RF modulator is gonna always output in color. Meanwhile, that composite output is gonna be monochrome. So that way you're not gonna have any like dot crawl or whatever if you're plugging in a monochrome monitor. Looks like we have a simple circuit for the sound amplifier here. And then all this stuff above here is for the cassette in and out and like the record functionality. And that goes to the cassette connector. And it looks like the ULA takes five volts through those resistors. Does it actually use the minus five volt rail? Where is that connection? Here's minus five volts. Uh, it doesn't say where that goes exactly, but this does confirm that the AC that we saw coming through that barrel jack through the original power supply, it does only go to the expansion connector. It doesn't do anything else. We can see here on the expansion connector, we have plus five and minus five volts available. And it looks like the entire system has a 16 megahertz master clock, makes its way over to the ULA for the clock input and that generates the CPU clock. I'm looking around to see the minus five volts if it's used anywhere and I'm not seeing it. Oh, there's one right there. Okay, so for the cassette recording. So yeah, it's audio functionality. Okay, well, I'm glad we kept that because we want to preserve the functionality of the cassette port. Probably the system would work fine it, well, you know, boot up without it. It doesn't look like the ULA uses it, but obviously the cassette functionality uh, will not work without the minus five volts. Okay, so let's start poking around. So here's the CPU and we are gonna start with the reset signal pin 40. And we're also gonna look at the clock input pin 37. Make sure those look good. All right, I'm on the CPU and I did connect up temporarily this power switch so I can easily power the system on. Uh, wow, we're seeing nothing. And let's just uh, check the five volt rail here, make sure that it goes up. So that's five volts right there on the oscilloscope and it says 5.02 volts for high channel one down the bottom. I am assuming that we are not gonna see a clock input on pin 37 on the CPU. There is absolutely nothing on that pin at all. Now, fortunately that bodes badly because that stuff is generated directly from the ULA. But we do need to check that the clocks on the ULA are working because it's possible that without those working clocks, it won't generate any of those output signals. Like it won't come out of reset. And unfortunately it's this weird package here. I don't know what the pin numbers are. So best thing we can do is we can take a look at this IC right here, this LS169. Pin two is the clock that comes from the clock generator over here, 16 megahertz that goes in there. And then the output is pin 11 that goes into this other input here, uh, whatever plus 13 is. All right, so I'm on pin two and we plug in the power. 
We are getting a clock signal. This should be like a roughly 16 megahertz. Let's zoom in a little bit. Yep, 15 point whatever. Good enough. And then here we are on pin 11. Let me zoom out a little bit. 1.23 megahertz. I'm pretty sure the jumping around that you're seeing is just like my ground lead. Yeah, if I hold on the lead, <laughs> it's not jumping as much. Yeah, I just, I'm using a really junky clip lead uh, for picking up the ground there. So yeah, there we go, 1.23 megahertz on the clock input. And this is a bad sign, everyone, because we're getting the good clock inputs here, and that's what's necessary for the ULA to start working. Incidentally, this HS here, I don't know if that's an input or an output. Let's just see what this is doing. Nope, that's an output. I think it might have something to do with the color burst because this is the clock generator here for color burst. And that is actually gated right here uh, with this, which is that HS output. And you can see here it says color burst. Well, this is pretty unfortunate actually because I don't really know what is going on here. I, I think whatever's going on, it's this ULA. So I found a service manual for the Electron and it looks like that's the original ULA package. So it was like a kind of a PLCC kind of thing. Oh no, actually it wasn't regular PLCC. It was like this little, I don't know what this is called, a flip chip or something. I've seen this for Intel 286 packaging. It's like a very thin ceramic package and it uses this metal plate. You kind of clip into the socket and push down on it. Yeah, right here, the text tool socket has a retention bar. And this is the issue six that we have. Has a blob type ULA on a daughter board. RGB outputs are now buffered. And there's an optional four RAM chips on a plug-in module containing surface mount ICs. Continuing on, I just noticed here, there's a power on reset circuit on Palm Power On. This RC circuit connected to this input provides the VE edge to reset parts of the US ULA and, and cause the ULA to activate the reset line, which resets the processor. Ah, I didn't even notice that signal. And there it is, POR pin 54, and it's a very simple capacitor and a resistor. So it just tries to charge this up to five volts and takes a little bit of time. And well, let's, uh, let's go investigate that. There's the capacitor C9 and it's a tantalum, one microfarad, 35 volts. It might be shorted for all we know. And that might cause an issue. Now we're up at five volts right now. Let's turn this off and plug this in. I don't know how slow that should actually raise up. I just used this calculator on DigiKey here. So 56K, one microfarad and 0 0.56 seconds. So I guess the fact that it goes up to five volts quickly is expected. I could try putting a larger value for the resistor in there or putting a larger capacitor in, which would slow down that initial reset just to see if that somehow changes things. But as it sits right now, yeah, it seems to kind of be behaving as I would expect. All right, let's just go back to the manual here, see if we can get any clues. So that 13 in, by the way, was divided by 13 in, which is why we're getting that, that 1.2 whatever megahertz, sounds right. We're into the troubleshooting section of the manual. So it says start with the power supply, which we already know that's good because we replaced it. And then uh, look for 16 volts, four volt peak to peak. Well, we're getting that. We already saw that on the scope. Now it's talking about the ULA and obviously there's some kind of removal process, which I don't think we can do. Well, and scrolling through the rest of this, it just sort of assumes the ULA is working. I mean, after the ULA, it just says, you know, check your CPU clocks and whatever. And obviously we're not getting those. So I think we're kind of stuck. I, this machine is so simple. All that can really be wrong is this ULA is bad. We do have a separate schematic here for issue six, which has the changes that we already know about. Let's just check this RC circuit here. Yep, so same 56K, one microfarad cap. If this tantalum were shorted, which can happen with tantalums, what would happen is the reset signal would be shorted to ground all the time, which would prevent the ULA from operating because this is uh, a reset low signal. So it needs to float away from ground up to five volts for the operation to begin. And when we connected the oscilloscope to that line, uh, which we're on right now, actually, it's up at five volts. So yeah, that's not the problem. I noticed a few small changes from the various issues and issue six here the clock output that goes to the CPU, the clock output that's not working is actually buffered here through this gate. Now you might be going, oh, maybe the gate's wrong. That's why you don't have a clock on the CPU. I don't think that's the case. I didn't figure out which actual pad on the ULA is this pin here, the output. The problem is the reset signal that's going into 
the CPU is also held down at ground, which means the CPU is never gonna leave reset, which means even if the clock were there, it would never execute any code. So I can pretty much assume though that we are not getting any clock output. I suppose just in case, let's look for this link nine. There's gonna be some couple pads on the board there and we'll just make sure there's no clock on either side. Link nine is right here and there's nothing on that pin and nothing on that pin. Well, just it's jumping around, but that's again, my bad ground. Oh, it actually says here that IC18 is not fitted on this revision which is kind of strange because the 7408 is right here. I have my finger on it. It is absolutely fitted in the board. And that jumper link is not closed, which means the CPU would never get any clock signal if, uh, well, that IC were not installed. I think at this point, all that's really left to do is to take the board out. And I'm just gonna inspect on the bottom side because now that I look at that bodge wire that's right here, looks like a trace is actually like ripped up or missing right here. And I guess something might've happened. Like, did this, did this thing get reworked? If I take the board out, we should be able to see on the backside if rework has happened to this, is maybe this thing has had a, has a, had a life. It's certainly in really nice physical shape. So I'm kind of surprised about that, but I suppose uh, we should just uh, take this out and verify what's going on because maybe behind here on behind the ULA, we'll see some strange stuff as well. Okay, the board is out. That was pretty easy. It just uh, takes some screws out, disconnect the speaker, and that just pops right out. Let's see what we see on the backside. Oh yeah, okay. That CPU has absolutely been reworked here. The rest of the board has really nice quality soldering, no issues. Oh, the ULA is not, it's not even soldered in. What the? What the heck? Seriously, it's just, it's just sitting in there. <laughs> I don't understand. What is going on with that? Someone desoldered this and obviously the CPU as well, I guess, but then the ULA is just sitting in there. Is this thing actually like loose? It doesn't come out. I don't want to force it out. That's probably, I probably ripped that trace. Like when someone removed this, they didn't do a very good job. I'm also noticing that the CPU here is a Rockwell part, which may not be compatible with that variable clock speed and the halting that the UOLA does on this machine. So someone might have swapped this thing in and they put in, they put in the wrong CPU. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab the desoldering iron. I'm gonna try to free this so we can get this out of the board because we really need to inspect the other side. I got this out. <laughs> that was a lot of work. And I think the problem was really whoever did this work before, uh, they, I don't know, maybe they, they were attempting to desolder this and then they gave up. Either way, the fact that this is off, it's good now because I can inspect for further damage underneath here because I just don't trust the work that's been done. Definitely this bodge wire is due to a rip trace that was right there. Well, now that this is out too, I'm kind of thinking that I'm gonna put pin headers in the board and then I'm just gonna plug this into the pin headers. Like I do not wanna go through all that effort to desolder and resolder this, especially if this ULA is actually bad. Before I solder down these pin headers, I'm gonna put the ULA into the, the pins. So what I need to do is just straighten these pins out because they are all pretty mangled actually. And that'll just give me a chance of even getting this in. I wonder if I could find a CPU or something that could fit into here so I could just, I wanna make sure when I solder this in, it's, uh, you know, the pins are all lined up. All right, how about this Motorola 68030? I think that's gonna work. It's got too many pins, but that's fine. I just wanna make sure that it is in there all the way, just like that. So now when I solder all these pins on, I know they're gonna be perfectly aligned so that I can straighten the pins out on the ULA here, which the bodge wire came off. And then, <laughs> yeah, uh, it, the alignment should not be an issue. All right, so the socket is installed and I even went ahead and I added the bodge wire onto the underside so we don't need that silly bodge wire on the top side anymore. 
And I did use the loop here to double check that there were no shorts, including on the bodge wire and everything looks good. So I think I should probably socket this CPU as well, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let me just double check that the bodge is going to the right pin, which is that one. And it's not shorted to any of these neighbor pins. <laughs> just double checking. <laughs> All right, so the ULA, now I have to try to get this back into this socket. And I'm gonna need to spend a while trying to straighten these pins because as I mentioned, they're a mangled mess. Well, I think this is maybe good enough to go into the socket. So there is the dot on the PCB and there's the edge of the ULA. And now, oh yeah, I think that's gonna work. I didn't push it down yet, but it's definitely, it's in there. All right. There we go, it's in the board. And since it's in a socket, that is not gonna come out. Now we do not need this bodge wire anymore. Let's just chop that off. Let's just double check that that bodge there makes its way here. Yes, it does, excellent. All right, well, this thing is ready for some further testing. Now that this is actually in the board properly, I can at least check the clocks and stuff like that. We still might not have operation due to this CPU being the wrong one, potentially. I need to go look at the data sheet, to be honest, on the Rockwell chip. Okay, I'm on the reset pin of the CPU. Let me plug in the 12 volt power supply into the wall here. The jumper is not installed, and I wanna see it in real time if this thing comes to life. <gasps> Whoa, we're out of reset, everyone. How about the clock? Oh, ho, ho, we're getting activity. We are freaking getting activity. Okay, okay, let's plug in the video cable here. All right, we are getting some sign of freaking activity on the screen. Look at that. Fact is the reset signal looks freaking good. Nine, eight, and seven, and that's the clock. And you can see the halting that it's doing. So that I guess stops high. So this thing really does seem like it's trying to run here. And I'm just looking at some of the signals on the RAM chips. I mean, and there's activity. There's normal looking activity. Oh, yes. All right, next step, I'm gonna get the CPU out of here. I'll put a socket there. And then I'm gonna put a CPU in there that it says will work with it, but maybe I can actually try a 65 CO2. So not the version that you get nowadays, the WD 65 CO2, the older version, like from Apple II E motherboards. That one should have the ability to stop its clock or change clock speeds on the fly like this computer needs. All right, we have a little bit of a jump cut. I have a different CPU in there. That's the one that was in here. This is the Rockwell one. This is a 6502A, and I haven't looked up the data sheet for this one, but let's just see what happens with this one in there. All right, here we go. Oh, ho, ho, ho. I can't believe it. That was it. That was freaking it. Whoa, okay, so we can ignore the fact that there's like extraneous key presses because the keyboard's not connected. And I think uh, I think it's on the data bus directly. So that's what's happening there. But it's freaking, it's freaking working. <laughs> I thought the ULA in this thing was a goner. I just assumed it was going to be dead. And there it is freaking functioning. So let's look at the data sheet for this Rockwell part here, and let's see if we can figure out what exactly is going wrong. All right, so according to the Wikipedia article, it says here that it's using the Synertec variant because it needs the clock to be able to stop for 40 microseconds, and that's to facilitate that uh, video refresh thing. Here's the data sheet for the Rockwell chip that was found in this computer here, it's R6502. There's a bunch of different. So the R6502 40 pin, 64K of RAM, and then this has AP after it, and the A is two megahertz, and the P is plastic dip. Now, remember this article here says that it needs to be the 6502A variant, and I wonder if whoever put this in there thought that the A after the 6502 on this was actually appropriate. Well, if we scroll down here to the timing charts, clock cycle time for the two megahertz variant has a minimum of 0.5 microseconds and a maximum of 10. This cannot be stopped for 40 microseconds. It violates the timing table and almost certainly it causes the CPU to crash. And here's the Synertec CPU data sheet and the same minimum at the two megahertz part, but the maximum is 40, unlike this Rockwell part, which is only 10. 
Now I was looking around in my spare parts to find a CPU that would work in here. And the one that's in there is like a UMC 6502A. And I didn't look up the data sheet. I just stuck it in there and we just tested it and it worked. But I had a thought that if I couldn't find a Cinertech chip or one that would work at that 40 nanoseconds, that I would go and harvest a 65C02 from an Apple IIe because I have a couple spare motherboards. And at least for testing purposes, that would be a good test. And the reason why is because take a look at the data sheet here. So the cycle time for the two megahertz part has the same minimum at 500, it's in nanoseconds, but that's the same as 0.5 microseconds. But then notice the maximum says note one. And if we look down here on note one, it actually says all processors can be stopped with O2 held high. And we looked back at the data sheet at the clock signal going to the CPU. I noticed that the ULA on this does exactly that. When it's halting the chip, the clock cycle actually stays high. So a 65 CO2, a Rockwell version, which is an old 80s chip, would totally work on this. And that chip can be held indefinitely in the halt state. Now it's possible that using a 65 CO2 from an Apple IIe could cause some issues though, is because some of the undocumented instructions in the old 6502 don't work as expected in the 65 CO2 variant. I know on the 1541, for instance, that's the Commodore disk drive, the 6502 that's in there actually is a non-C variant. And if you put a C variant in there, the disk drive generally works fine, but certain fast loaders with certain demos or cracked programs crash the disk drive. And that's because they use that undocumented instructions because the 1541 has so little RAM, they're trying to squeeze every little part of performance out of that chip and every byte free matters. So sometimes those undocumented instructions allow you to save a byte by combining two other instructions and, and things like that. At least that's what I understand. But in the case of the Electron, I didn't need to go harvest anything because let's zoom in here. So there it is. It's a UMC maybe, 6502A. I guess it has a core that's similar to the Cinertech or it's the same core, they just rebadged it or whatever. It can actually halt for that 40 microseconds and not crash. Now let's turn this thing back on again and let's just see it in operation. There it is. It's freaking working. <laughs> oh, that's just... So awesome. Now, in case anyone was wondering, I just turned it off. Let's pop the CPU out of here. Let's look at what this thing does when no CPU is installed at all. I have a feeling it's probably gonna have those lines that we saw when we were testing earlier. Okay, it's a little bit different, but I wouldn't be surprised if I power cycle this a few times. We'll just kind of get random garbage, which I think was happening with this CPU. It's also possible this Rockwell CPU, oh, there we go. That's the exact screen we were getting. It's possible this CPU is just bad. So I should probably find something to test this in. But what do I have handy that this could work in? Hmm, I've decided to use this. The Ziff VIC-20 board. Of course, the VIC-20 uses 6502 and it's extra easy to replace the CPU on this board since it has a Ziff socket. So let's hook this up and see if this original CPU is working. The CPU that's in the VIC-20 was incidentally the Cinertech 6502. So I didn't know if I had one of these to put back into the Electron. Well, turns out I do. <laughs> there was one in the VIC-20. So place your bets. Does this Rockwell chip actually work? Probably does. And I think it was just the wrong part to go into that machine. There it is, absolutely working fine. So whoever had worked on the Electron last put in a CPU that was not compatible with the weird abuse that the ULA does to the clock cycle on the CPU. And it makes me wonder, did the CPU go bad? They swapped it out and then they thought the ULA was bad as well. So they went to desolder it and they couldn't get it off properly. And then they got frustrated and gave up. I guess we'll never know for sure. Well, for now, I just put the CPU back in there. Let's turn this on. We need to plug the keyboard in because I have a feeling we're gonna have issues with the keyboard. And I think that is because just like on the BBC Master, oops, stuff was just falling out. I think the key switches get oxidized and then don't work super well. Let's power this on. Hey, I plugged the speaker back in too and we got a beep. So that's a good indicator. Okay, so we're not getting all those random characters. Okay, the enter key works. Oh wait, maybe this thing freaking works. <laughs> this is so great. Mistake. <laughs> mode. Does this change the screen mode? I can't remember. Oh, yes, it does. Okay. So there we go. That's one of the modes that, uh, well, none of the other contemporaries of this machine in the cheap economy price had. All right. Well, after a little bit of typing, I have found an entire road doesn't work very reliably. The nine key 
the O key, L, well now they're working, and the period wasn't working, but I'm wondering if we have a bad connection with that ribbon cable. Let me just sort of tweak the keyboard, yep. Period, L, O is not working now, and nor is nine. So something must be going on with the, the ribbon cable because now if I just move this a little bit, it starts working. So let's investigate what's going on there. There just might be a little bit of a break in the ribbon. So I'm not really seeing anything wrong with this cable. Now the good thing is, is the pin spacing on the connector on the motherboard is pretty standard. Things look pretty standardized under here as well. So it wouldn't be impossible to replace this with a regular ribbon cable. But I think for now, I'm just gonna leave this as is. Maybe I'll put a little deoxid in the connector there. And that might be all that's necessary to make this thing work properly. At least it seems like all the key switches are good. So I won't need to desolder this whole PCB to get those out and clean them one by one like I did on the BBC Master. Now you may be noticing that things look a little different in the power supply section here. And that's because this is a couple days later since I stopped building the last segment. When I was done recording that last section, I placed the keyboard on top and I noticed it didn't fit. It was having a clearance issue with that large zero insertion ports connector on the board here and the back of the keyboard. So I ended up taking that off and moving this all up towards the top edge of the case. I also switched out the DC barrel jack here. So now it all closes up properly. So let's put some deoxid into the connector here and let's just see while the case is fully assembled, does the keyboard work properly? It's hard to know if the problem was in the contacts with the pins or perhaps it was something in that area there when the ribbon cable was being bent. With the keyboard installed into the position it will be when this thing is screwed back together, let's power this on, see what happens. We had a nice beep there. So nine, O, L and period. All right, yeah, good. Everything does appear to be working. So the next thing I wanna do with this motherboard is similar to what I did with the BBC Master. I'm gonna swap out the color crystal from the PAL one to the NTSC crystal, and that'll allow me to get color video through the composite output when I'm using this with an NTSC monitor. If you don't change out the ROM, you're still gonna get a 50 Hertz video signal, but the color encoding is actually gonna be NTSC. And there's also an additional jumper that I'm gonna to have to fix that will route the color video signal over here to the composite output, because obviously I can't use this RF modulator because this modulator here is designed for the PAL markets so that the frequency channel spacing and all that stuff is completely not compatible with an NTSC monitor. So first order of business is let's get this PAL crystal out of the board. I'll be using the desoldering iron. There we go, that came out quite easily. Next up is the LK2 jumper. This is to select monochrome or color for the composite output. There is a trace that goes between these two pads. I just need to cut through that so that I can install three pins and install a jumper in either position if I want color or monochrome. I'll use my little engraver, which I find really good for clearing out traces between pads. In the past, I've always used a knife to do that. It's just such a pain. A little engraver is a perfect tool for this. Oh, I just realized I was talking about LK2 like it was color or monochrome. This is actually for PAL or NTSC. For color or monochrome, it is this one, LK4. So we'll just clear these out. And then the final mod that it says they have to do is change out this capacitor here, C18, from a 39 picofarad to a 56. Now, I don't have a 56 picofarad. I really need to buy some, uh, a little assortment of small caps. I found a little 18 picofarad cap, and I think I can just parallel this one, and that should do the trick. I'm just going to install this on the bottom side of the board. There we go. This cap probably has something to do with the resonance of the circuit or something like that. Now I have the RGB to HDMI connected and unfortunately it has no capability of decoding this weird hybrid NTSC 50, which is what this is gonna generate. Well, I think this is what this is gonna generate. So I'm gonna put the jumper in the NTSC position there. And because I haven't installed the color jumper on here yet, we should still get a 50 Hertz video signal out of this thing. Let's see what happened. Now we're gonna get the weird uh, key presses because I don't have the keyboard connected. Hey, at least we have a working video signal. Now, what I want to know for sure is, is this thing running in 50 hertz right now? Because that's what I needed to be doing. And yes, it absolutely is 49.98 hertz at 625i. Now, the reason why I wouldn't want this to run in 60 hertz is because we would have less lines because we'll be running in, what, 525 mode? And the issue is all the video modes that are on this, along with the BBC Micro and the BBC Master, are designed for PAL in mind. So the short-lived version of the BBC Micro that was released here in North America 
when it was running with NTSC ROMs at 60 hertz, so basically compatible with all of our TVs, the video modes had less lines and that broke pretty much all the software that was out there. So this hybrid NTSC mode is actually really useful because it's compatible with most older NTSC sets and yet it's still running at the right resolution with the right number of lines. Now, if I take the jumper for the color and I install this on here, yep, it's gonna right away cause a problem. And that's just because this thing cannot decode color properly when there's an NTSC color burst on a 50 Hertz signal. Let's do a few sanity checks. So what we're looking at here is pin three on IC11, which is the output of the clock generator for the color burst. And I currently have that 14.318 megahertz crystal in there. And we're getting, well, about the right signal. Now there is a variable capacitor right here, which allows you to fine tune it. Unfortunately, the frequency counter on this oscilloscope is not fine grain enough for me to be able to do that here. It will probably be best if I plug it into a monitor and generate some color display, and then we'll tune that capacitor until we get a nice rock solid color image. Now what we're looking at here is pin one on IC14, and this is the actual NTSC color burst frequencies, like 3.54 megahertz or so. Then yeah, this is correct. So we have a sync pulse, then we have what would be the color burst, and then we have the rest of the luminance information and any other color info that would be there as well. And when we run this on auto, let's see if I could stop it in the right spot. There we go. So that is some of the text that's currently on screen. So again, color burst, there's a border, and then the text begins, and that's the luminance information from the text. So I think this probably is working. Now, looking at this whole series of gates and things, it looks like there is a part here that should not be fitted for NTSC. So I may just clip one side of this resistor. This is the resistor R57, and look how long that lead is there. That's perfect. So I can just snip that like that. And if I ever want to reconnect it, it's very simple just to re-solder that on the top side of the board. All right, we have the Commodore 1084 hooked up through composite. This is a North American monitor, so it does not decode PAL color but it will of course handle 50 Hertz without any problem. I wrote a small basic program to cycle through all 15 or 16 of the colors and let's hit run. All right, well, we're getting some colors, but they definitely don't look right. The yellow and the blue are fine. Obviously the white is fine, but these other ones, not so much. So I have a flat blade. I'm gonna adjust this variable capacitor that is right by the crystal. And let's see if that changes anything. Well, it makes the color go in and out, but it is not fixing this mess that we're seeing here. Let's try hooking up the RGB to this monitor. Let's see how that looks. I have a cable here that I used on the BBC Master. It had a SCART connector on it, but I removed it and it is now just regular RGB. All right, let's push the button. All right, well that's, yeah, that's how it should look. <laughs> Those are the colors we should be seeing. So there's a red, there's a green, there's purple, cyan, and of course, yellow. But when we switch back to composite, wait, what's happening here? Why, we lost our, we lost the color altogether. When I plug the RGB cable, same thing. The only thing I can think of here is the adjustable potentiometer is somehow out of calibration. Oh yeah, that was it, okay. Now let me switch the jumper here between PAL and TSC. So if I take the jumper off, oh, wait a second. I removed the jumper altogether, the PAL NTSC jumper, and now the colors look correct. Now the service manual says that when the jumper is in the south setting, that means the two pins connected are closer to me, that is PAL. We very clearly are getting the correct color encoding here for NTSC now with the jumper in the south position. And it was in the north position, which is what I had it set to because the manual said to put it there for NTSC that we were getting those completely wrong colors. So I guess the manual has an error in it. Maybe there was just not a lot of validation of the NTSC stuff because clearly things are looking good here. Reviewing the footage confirms my suspicions that the manual was wrong. The trace that I ate away with the grinder was on the north side that enabled the PAL mode. That goes without saying, the color composite video looks pretty terrible and that's partially because we're running at this hybrid NTSC 50 mode but also I think the video output circuitry of this is not really designed for a really clear color composite video signal because of course you have the RGB mode to use and this looks incredibly sharp and amazing. The color phase is reversed here, meaning that the purple color is up here, color five, and color five is cyan and color six is purple and that's reversed and the red and the green are also reversed. So, okay, so it's not working perfectly. I think there's some other changes that would probably need to happen to that circuit that converts the RGB to composite, but whatever, you know what? I just wanted to get NTSC color working to some extent 
and it is here. But the reality is I'm probably just gonna leave this jumper removed from the board so we get a nice clear monochrome signal instead. We are back to video capture and I've been playing around with this computer with some basic programs just to be some random stuff in. And it seems to be working perfectly. I must admit the layout of the keyboard, it's a little bit unusual, specifically the fact that the delete or backspace key is this one right here. So when you're typing, it's pretty awkward to hit that. The key that would normally be in the backspace position is the reset key or break. And it basically issues a hardware reset to the computer which has an interesting and frustrating side effect. So you see my little program there? If I push the reset or break key, the program is gone. Now there is a basic command called restore and I thought that might like restore your program and that does not do it. It seems that hitting control break actually issues like a hard reset because we're getting a beep command. But of course my program is long gone. Just, just pushing this doesn't make the computer beep. So I would think it would be like on the Apple II pushing control reset, which does not cause your basic program to be erased from memory. Otherwise though, this keyboard is absolutely working perfectly. I haven't had any issues with it. So whatever was going on with that ribbon cable seems to be fixed with some deoxid. And the feel of these keys is absolutely fantastic. The key switch feel on this computer is probably up there with one of the best I've ever felt on any 8-bit computer. And I accidentally just hit the reset button <laughs> with my hand talking. Now looking in the manual here, there is a section on the cassette interface port. And it looks like pin three is actually the input from cassette and also ground is pin two. Looking through my cables, I found this five pin DIN cable to this TR jack tip and ring. And I used my multimeter to tone it out and the sleeve here is connected to the ground or pin two and pin three is the tip there. So it absolutely matches what this computer is looking for for the cassette input. And after a little bit of searching, I found this great open source project called Play UEF, which is a JavaScript emulator for loading tape programs on both the Acorn Electron and the BBC Micro series of machines. Even better is there's an online version that you can just click and access right here. And it already has loaded a piece of Acorn software and I hit play. Well, let me turn that down, but basically you're gonna hear all the carrier stuff and it's kind of cool. It even shows you the data itself that's going in. Connecting this adapter here to the end of the cable results in two RCAs. And I figured out that it is the white jack here that goes to the appropriate pins on the DIN connector, pin two and pin three. But unfortunately connecting the RCA jack up to my USB DAC and plugging this into the Acorn results in pretty much nothing. According to the manual here, you type chain and a quote, quote, two quotes. And when you hit enter, it just says searching. And I assume it's just looking for the first program that comes up on the virtual tape. But with this plugged in and I hit play on the web browser, the computer unfortunately always just says searching. And I even hooked up the oscilloscope to pins two and three on the connector here. And I saw about 2.5 volts peak to peak of the audio signal that coming through. And yet the computer can't hear anything. I tried looking through the manual here on the correct volume settings or any kind of tips on how to make that work. And there really was nothing. It just sort of said, play the tape and it should show up as searching. So unfortunately that leads me to believe there's something wrong with the audio input circuitry on the Electron. And while I'd love to dig in and try to troubleshoot that particular problem on the Electron, I think that's better left to part two because this video is already pretty darn long. So that is it for at least part one of the repair on this Acorn Electron. All that was wrong with this was the wrong CPU was installed and the ULA was just completely desoldered. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on how this computer might have got to this particular situation. Now Jude, who originally sent this machine into the basement, I'm sure is gonna be watching this video. So Jude, this is a question to you. If you know anything about what happened here, I would love to hear about it in a comment and I will pin that so other people can see it. To me, this seems like it was a botched repair attempt where maybe the CPU had failed and they swapped in another CPU and then that resulted in the entire machine not working. So then they went to desolder the ULA, ripped that trace and then just gave up on the entire machine. Now, while this machine appears to be working properly, we're not totally out of the water because unfortunately the ULA is also responsible for the cassette loading and it's possible all that circuitry is working that feeds the audio or the signal into the ULA and then the ULA itself is bad. We'll find out when we dig into this machine in part two and I troubleshoot the audio stages of that cassette input and we can see the signal going into the ULA or not. 
and hopefully it's an external component that's gone bad, which we can fix. If it's the ULA, I'm not even sure how obtainable these Issue 6 ULAs are. If there are sources of these Issue 6 ULAs around, definitely let me know as well in the comment section, just in case I do end up needing to buy one. So I think that's gonna be it for this video for real this time. I'm not sure how many Acorn Electrons exist out in the world that have this hybrid NTSC thing going on like this machine. So that at least makes this thing very unique, not to mention my DC 12 volt power input. So I can get away from trying to use that weird AC 19 volt input. If you like this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do, all that usual YouTube stuff. Huge thanks to my patrons. They make it possible that I do this full time. So a giant thank you to them. Patrons get early access to videos and other cool behind this scene stuff. There's a link down in the description below if you want to become a patron. And I guess that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.